Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. Today, we're going to be talking about doctors' reputations and how the use of social media today by patients can have a really big impact on what people are reading online about a particular doctor or his or her practice. I'm really excited to have two of my colleagues here with me today. First, there's Mark Kalish, a shareholder at Retzel and Andrus and part of our litigation department in the Chicago office. And Julia Mohan, also in our litigation department in Chicago as well. And I really appreciate them both being here today. And this is a topic that we've all worked on together. So thanks for joining me. Thanks for having us, Erica. Well, so first, why don't we start by just saying that according to medical economics, about 65% of patients are choosing their physicians based on what they read online. And like anything else in social media, not everything you read online is true. But when it comes to reputation for physicians, misinformation online can be a real problem. So when you Google a physician and you see somebody saying that doctor was terrible or that doctor did this, that doctor did that, it's hard to know what to believe. And some of it can be very harmful to a physician's reputation. So one of the first things I kind of wanted to have you explain is what kind of comments can people make about physicians online that physicians can really even do anything about to begin with? So Mark, maybe you could tell us that. Sure, Erica. Well, you're totally right that today, um, online reviews of doctors really influence where uh, people uh, decide to treat. And so when patients make statements about doctors, it can affect their livelihood, their practice, um, the the amount of patients that they get to see. So um, sometimes uh, it becomes problematic if a patient uh, is putting things up on one of these uh, informational sites or rating sites that are blatantly false and that can be malicious and can be very detrimental to a physician's um, reputation and ultimately to their livelihood. On the other hand, um, you know, patients just indicating uh, that they don't care for the, the doctor's personality, they think that they rushed them, they thought their office staff was inefficient or something like that, is just opinion and it's totally legal, it's totally proper, and it's probably what um, these websites are are in existence for. However, it crosses the line when patients make uh, blatantly false accusations about physicians that impugn their professional ability um, or their um, ability to treat patients. And so we, as you know, um, we've been involved in a number of cases where um, patients have made systemic complaints that are absolutely false that um, disparage doctors, indicate that they've committed malpractice when it was untrue that they had committed malpractice, and also made blatantly false uh, statements that have affected a doctor's livelihood by reducing the amount of referrals that they receive from the internet and from these uh, reputational sites. So um, it's it's a big issue out there today. So in terms of defamation, if you're saying something like the doctor has a bad bedside manner or the doctor made me wait in the waiting room too long or, or things like that, those are very different than saying the doctor you know, killed my mother, the doctor did surgery on the wrong body part, the doctor failed to diagnose me, those kinds of things. Uh, there's a distinction. Having an opinion is going to be something where you can absolutely have it, but stating something that is false is really the line between where the doctor can take some action or not, correct? Right. Under defamation law, um, uh, truth is an ultimate defense and also an opinion, whether it's truthful or not, if it's, if it's simply an opinion of the speaker, it's not actionable as uh, defamation. However, if somebody makes a statement on one of these websites that's blatantly false, and again, hurts the reputation of the doctor, then that can definitely be uh, actionable under defamation law, under uh, slander and libel laws, which are kind of all grouped into, into one basket, which is really disparaging remarks that are, that are false. And so as you know, Erica, you know, we've, had, we've represented doctors where, again, your example, 
where they said that the, that the patient says that the doctor operated on the wrong uh, appendage, which was absolutely false. The doctor looked through his records. There never was an, uh, an allegation of malpractice. There never was a patient um, you know, that, gave, that described what happened on their website. And it was just um, completely malicious. And so in that situation, um, the doctor was very upset that this was hurting his reputation. Um, you know, clearly operating on the wrong appendage is a very big issue for a, a, an orthopedic surgeon. And he felt that it had hurt his, um, it had hurt his reputation. And furthermore, uh, when they looked through the records, the patient's name appeared to be false or fictitious. So it was the belief that this was really um, somebody that was trying to malign the doctor that was not being truthful. They couldn't find records to back it up. And so they hired our, our law firm and we actually went through a number of steps, both um, using some computer forensic techniques and the subpoena powers of the court. And eventually we had uncovered that the poster of that um, malicious um, review was in fact a disgruntled vendor um, of which the physician had canceled his contract with them. Uh, and uh, this was retaliation against the doctor uh, we, we sued them. We sued them for slander. And ultimately, we settled with them uh, and forced them to take down these absolutely false and very harmful um, reviews that were made against the doctor. Well, and that, that was a really, you know, interesting case that we worked on. So I want to take a step back because one of the first things that happens is the doctor is informed that there's something negative online about that. Maybe another patient or doctor tells them maybe they've hired one of those companies to kind of monitor the reviews that are out there. And so their first inclination is always to respond back and say, that's not true or that's not how it happened. And of course, from a healthcare perspective, we don't want doctors responding online to anything because acknowledging somebody's your patient can uh, present HIPAA issues. And you know how you should respond if you're gonna respond at all is a, a bit of a different topic. But let's say you have identified uh, a, a bad review um, and it's completely false and it's not just an opinion. Um, you know, what we wanna do then is figure out, is this person a patient? Is this person not a patient? So maybe Julia, you can talk a little bit about what to do once you um, see that somebody has done something and maybe speak to the difference between when we know who it is and we don't know who it is and what the next step might be. Yeah, yeah, that is um, a very good point. Oftentimes people, you know, one of the positives and negatives of the internet is you can post things anonymously or you can create a name or an email that you post from and it, it might not tell you the true poster. We have had cases where people used their real email address, which made things much easier. Um, however, it's quite common for people not to do that. And it, it, it's a multi-step process in order to ascertain who is actually doing the posting. And oftentimes a doctor might have a suspicion, but that's not really enough for a lawsuit. Um, the first thing that we would do is you issue a subpoena to the website where you can see the post. And that website should be able to identify the IP address of the poster. The IP address is um, a way of identifying the computer or the device that the post was made from. Um, the second step then would be to issue a subpoena to an internet service provider associated with that IP address, right? So you're actually doing two subpoenas, first to the website for the IP address, and then to the internet service provider, your Comcast or Sprint, to give you the subscriber information associated with that IP address. And that's where you get the identifying information of the person who made the post. One thing though to keep in mind is you sort of have to act fast. The internet service providers, your Comcast or Sprint, often give what's called a dynamic IP address to a device. So, my phone could have an IP address associated with it for a week, a number of days, and then it would have a new one. The ISPs often only keep their records now for about 90 days or 120 days um, because they're constantly changing these IP addresses. And so in order to get that subscriber information, you really have to act fast in issuing these subpoenas um, to get the information you need and find out who made the post. 
cloud. So once we get the information, you know, what can we do with it, I guess, is it um, assuming we act quickly enough? Yeah, there are a couple options. Um, a strongly worded letter from a lawyer is often effective. Um, even aside from what you said of having a doctor respond to online, you always wanna be careful even outside the healthcare setting of having a response. Somebody malicious could take a response and just repost it, right? And, and, and essentially get in a battle of words online, which we wanna avoid. Um, but a letter from an attorney can be effective. Often what also works too, um, filing a lawsuit. You know, you can file a lawsuit for defamation because if this is harming the business or impugning the doctor's ability to do his job, there are consequences for that. Um, there are, is another measure too, often notifying the website of this. Often these posts will violate their terms of service. Um, we had a lawsuit one time, Mark, where a person was posting repeatedly. And once we made the website aware of that, they took action. They noted that these were repetitive. They were coming from the same IP address. Um, and so those were violations of terms of service. They, they weren't intended to just be a forum for duplicative finger pointing reviews. Um, so there the, are options. Many of the websites also, so in their terms of service, they do not allow false statements. So sometimes if you can prove for in, in the example of you've done a review of your um, of your patients and you can't find a patient name that matches the name on there or the type of um, procedure that they're alleging. So it appears to be completely fabricated. If one of the terms of service is on the website that you can't post false misleading information or false reviews, just by sending a letter to the, um, the website and providing them with evidence that the post is false and malicious, they may take it down. Some uh, of these review sites are very responsive. Other, others will not respond unless you begin taking formal action against them, uh, bring them into lawsuit, issue subpoenas, get their lawyers involved. And all of a sudden, sometimes you'll get more of a response once their legal teams behind these websites um, approach you. But sometimes it's even difficult to find an address or a way to contact the um, legal representatives of these websites, because again, they're just, their, their boards in, you know, in, in cyber world. So um, a lot of times it's just a challenge to get to somebody who has responsibility for the board and their legal representative. Um, so those are all issues, but sometimes it can be very effective if you can prove to them that um, somebody is doing something malicious. Uh, often it's a violation of their terms of service and they'll, and they'll take it down. Right, and a lot of times when we know who the person is posting online, you know, and it's something about the office, like, you know, I, I, they said I didn't pay my bill when I did, you know, and we know it's not true. Obviously, the office of the doctor can certainly reach out directly, not mentioning anything online, of course, and work something out for that person to uh, take the information down. But you're absolutely right, Julia, that, you know, I, I've had situations where somebody tried to do that, uh, and then the, uh, the patient started posting those discussions online and you know people are choosing sites that brings a lot of bad attention to the website doctors don't really have time for that uh of course and nobody really wants to get into that uh, some doctors might choose to just not allow comments on sites that they can control but certainly you can't do anything on the health grades and the yelps of the world right um but when, when it comes down to it you know doctors do have a couple of different options one is you know does this really matter if you've got five thousand five star reviews and and one small one, it is also a matter of, do I want to put time, effort, and money into fighting about this? And that's a really important decision because this can be an expensive process and the outcome can be uncertain, um, you know, whether you get the information in time, whether you can figure out who it is, uh, ex, you know, et cetera. So the outcome is somewhat uncertain. You can always invite patients who are happy with your services to post positive reviews um, instead. But Another issue, Erica, you know, that always has to be kind of when, when you're talking about a lawsuit, you always need to kind of evaluate what the ability is ultimately of the potential defendant to pay a judgment or award or whether they care, right? So again, in the, in the situation that we had before, where we had um, 
a provider of medical equipment to a practice that was then making these, these posts and was malicious, we went after them, we filed a lawsuit against them, and ultimately um, they wound up paying our attorney's fees and they, they, they paid um, a settlement fee because they had some, they had assets and the ability um, to, to sustain a judgment if we got a judgment against them, which we probably would have based upon their false posts. But the majority of the people that post maliciously, sometimes they have, they have mental illness, sometimes they're just members of the public and they don't really have assets um, or money that, so you have to decide what is your approach. You can possibly get injunctive relief. You can get a court to order um, that the post be taken down, but sometimes it's quicker and easier again, as we talked about, to go through the website to get it taken down. If you have um, a desire to, to get, you know, an award of money for, um, you know, the damages caused to your reputation or to your practice, or even the legal fees that you spent identifying the person and then tracking it down and proving that it's false, you always have to be aware of is the, the the ultimate defendant collectible in any lawsuit, but in particularly these lawsuits, you really have to take a good look at that before, as a physician, um, no matter how wrong you feel, um, before you want to invest, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, you know, to identify these people, to subpoena um, the various uh, internet providers and the websites, and then file lawsuits and get people served, and then commence a lawsuit. It could cost a lot of money. And you really need to make an evaluate what your goal is, uh, because if you think you're going to get your money reimbursed, the majority of people that are making these posts are not financially capable of, of giving you any kind of compensation. So you will have spent a lot of money. You will ultimately get a judgment and prove that you're right and possibly um, get an injunction or get the site to take it down, but there's, there's a high, it's highly unlikely that you may recover any money. And that's something that you always have to uh, consider when you're bringing a lawsuit against somebody. I, I think that's a great point. And what I was going to ask is, let's say your your reputation is damaged, in your opinion. Um, how do you go about showing that you were actually damaged or what the harm is? And is that kind of a hurdle that can be really difficult to overcome? Well, the law in Illinois actually um, tries to make um, reputational damage um, to your to your business. Um, easy to recover. So they, they, under the defamation laws, they have a thing called libel per se or slander per se, whether it's written or it's oral. And the per se means that it's assumed if you fall into a certain category of uh, slanderous conduct or defamatory conduct, that damages are assumed. And so one of those areas is if you, if, if you make a false statement about someone's business acumen or their ability to perform as a professional or in the realm of business to disparage them as corrupt business people or incompetent professionals. And so the law assumes that you have been damaged, even though it's difficult to show what the actual damages are, right? I mean, you can't, it's, it would be hard to say, oh, I lost a hundred patients and I would have gotten, you know, a hundred dollars per patient and, and come up with the calculation. So the law assumes that um, you have been damaged, whether you can actually show um, damages itself. And then there's kind of a, a complex, kind of very loose um, procedure for proving, proving to a judge actually what your harm is. And it's based upon what your income is, what your stature in the community is, and a number of factors. They're kind of amorphous factors. And the court or the trier of fact, whether it's a judge or a jury, has to come up with a dollar amount. And it's not necessarily directly, doesn't have to directly correlate to the amount of money you've lost, although, I mean, at some point, it's got to be attached to, to some economic factor, but it's it's rather vague. And again, the same problem is, depending on the judge or the jury, you may feel that you've been terribly harmed, and they may think that it's rather minor and not award significant damages. Or on the flip side, um, uh, the, the trier of fact or the judge could come to the conclusion that this was a terrible um, uh Thing to have done to your reputation and could give you millions of dollars in, in damages, assuming that they're collectible again. So, I mean, um, the damages are, are, are all, over the, all over the map and um, it's kind of on a case by case basis, but it's, the law assumes that if you just disparage somebody's business, um, that they have been harmed. And then there's, they're, they just, the, the, the trier factor judge has to go about figuring out how you should be compensated. Right. It's interesting, it's different than other damages 
you know, contractual damages, you know, are, are usually very certain, you know, you know, I, I was supposed to get paid this, I didn't get paid that. And so the difference between what I got paid and what I didn't get paid is your damages, which is very, you know, it's something that can be easily calculated. Um, in this area of law, it's much more vague uh, and subject to um, the kind of uh, how negative the comment is and you know, how, what profession you're in and, and how reputation affects your ability to work. Right. You know, and I think a lot of people feel like they can hide behind the keyboard, mm -hmm. not just when it comes to reputation, but just in general. I mean, anytime you're online, kind of shocking some of the things people will, will put out there. And I think, you know, just as an aside, doctors are, are pretty high income earners. And, you know, sometimes they don't display great behavior either. So just to your point that, you know, doctors, if they're the ones who are posting things online about other doctors, uh, whether they're competitors or something like that, which I've definitely had a couple of cases like that, the doctors also need to understand that they're actually pretty good targets and very worthwhile targets for lawyers to go after uh, if they're making statements that are false or untrue. I just thought that's really kind of circular thinking. Nobody wants to be the target of it, but if doctors who have deep pockets are the ones making these statements or, or you know, trying to hurt uh, a competitor, then they should be careful as well because the same logic that you've discussed here applies to them. Um, I, I would think that we've been involved, Erica, just on that point, just follow up on that point. Yeah. And we've been involved in cases where actually competitors um, in the dental field and other fields have posted negative um, comments on <laughs> other doctors for the, yeah. for the purpose of getting a competitive advantage. And in those situations, um, the courts will not look very favorably on that. In addition to being defamatory and having this per se um, assumption of damages, which is uh, left in large part to the, to the judge or the jury. In addition, there are statutes about unfair competition and um, other um, statutory penalties that come with uh, punitive damages, attorney's fees, and, and other things um, if uh, you're doing it for competitive uh, advantage. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, and uh, there could be very significant penalties as well as professional, <laughs> as well as prof I, I believe that the, the professional licensing boards also would, would probably take on this issue. I don't know if there's really been anyone that's lost their license on it, but to me, it would be an issue. Um, certainly professional uh, conduct for, for sure. Right. Mm -hmm. For dental boards or medical boards, if people right. are engaging in this kind of conduct. So it's that's all things to consider. Great, that's actually a great comment. Do you find Julia that people are, more likely to want to settle this when they first are contacted? Uh, do they recognize that it's going to be less expensive and easier or do they typically put up a fight thinking that it can't be proven? Well, with knowing that you're being malicious or saying false things, you know, you're not gonna find that people are gonna dig in their heels and fight quite as much because they can't back up what they're saying. Um, this is very different than a lot of fights where both parties do believe they're in the right. Um, I think a lot of parties are surprised that they could face legal action. Um, I think they are accustomed to the notion that you can say whatever you want online um, without any, you know, with impunity. Um, and so once they are approached with a letter from a lawyer or with service of process, I think they are more likely to engage. They're unhappy about it, but yeah, it's not really proper to dig in your heels if you have nothing to back it up. And I think some of the cases we did, we find most of these postings are done in the middle of the night, off hours. People have claimed, oh, I was drunk when I did that. So, you know, it's they're not on their best behavior. They recognize it as well. And it's like one of those things where you're kind of caught red handed, right? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times doctors really just want things taken down. They aren't necessarily looking for, you know, for money, uh, they just want it to go away and, and to, you know, they're not really looking for a big payday, which I think can help make it a quicker issue to resolve. Right. Both parties, I think one, once you get to that point, just really want to walk away. Both Everybody wants to walk away and have no further damage, you know. I agree. I think this is a fascinating topic. I really appreciate you guys coming on and, and talking about it with me. And uh, hopefully the listeners out there are getting, um, you know, some helpful information about what they should be thinking, uh, whether they're contemplating posting or have received some negative reviews. They'll, they'll think twice about both 
uh, in terms of how they respond to it. Do you have any final comments you want to share on this topic? You know what, I would just say that um, people should remember that when they're online, um, they may think that they can be anonymous, but they're not, that the internet is set up so that there are fingerprints that are, are, are left behind. And that if you're a doctor and you have somebody that is abusing the privilege to post repetitively and maliciously, that there are things that you can do and that you don't have to just take it and, and you can't identify who these people are and you can uh, seek redress through the websites and through the court system um, if the people are being malicious and, and hurting your practice or your peace of mind. And um, you know, we've been successful uh, righting the wrongs in the past. Great, Julia, any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would just to, to follow up on that, you know, doctors are professionals and even though these comments can, can warrant a emotional reaction, to not react, maintain that professionalism and call another professional, your lawyer, to see if you can deal with this outside of the realm of the public space. That's great advice. Well, thanks everyone for joining us on this episode of the Health Law Hotspot. We hope you'll join us next time. You can also check out some of our other podcasts at healthlaw.ralaw.com. And you can reach out to any of us at any time. And we hope to hear from you and to see you next time. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Thanks Erica. Erica. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.